Hello everyone, how are we doing today? And welcome to chapter seven, which is all on gene linkage, recombination, and genetic mapping. So this this is there's gonna be a lot of videos in this next chapter here, a few example problems. I'm doing uh, like three point test crosses and there's gonna be examples within the lectures and so forth. A lot of information here for how we do make genetic maps. So where genes are located on a chromosome, but to make genetic maps, usually we make them based on linked genes. So this first video here is a little bit of an introduction going over gene linkage and some of the notation we use to understand it. So gene linkage is exactly, you know, what it says here. So genes are linked. So genes are located close together on the same chromosome. So if we're looking over here, this would be, you know, two chromosomes down here, and I'll rewrite these to make it easier to see. So we have, you know, genes A and genes B. So these ones would be linked genes or located in the same region on this chromosome whereas if they were on separate chromosomes they so a would be here and then b would be on a different chromosome so this one's a different size right here um, don't worry about the recessive version imagine a second one right beside it so genes are located close together and because of this they are less likely to sort independently so remember independent assortment, if these two genes are located on two different chromosomes, there's an equal opportunity for that chromosome to go that way as it is to go that way. Whereas if these genes were on the same chromosome, they'd sort together, not independently from each other because they're stuck together, they're linked together. But there's, well, in the next videos, we'll talk about examples where they can separate. If you remember back in meiosis, there's an event called crossing over. So you can get independent assortment here if you cross over, let's say, this region of this chromosome was this region of this chromosome, you switch those ends, then that would cause independent assortment. And that's the key to these linked genes and also producing gen genetic maps from linked genes. So let's uh, go over that a little bit more. So independently assorting genes versus linked genes. Uh, so let's draw this out here. So these are our typical, you know, parent strains here for, you know, either independent assortment or, or length, so this is just a general way we're going to start this difference. Both of these make the same gametes. These ones all make, you know, all homozygous dominant. These ones all make heterozygous gametes. And, you know, when you do this cross, all the products are going to be dihybrid individuals. So dihybrid, not dihybrid, dihybrid heterozygotes. Um, so this is a typical parent cross. We've done this back in the typical Mendel inheritance, and this one's going to be the same over here. And then the gametes that could be produced from these, you know, you got four gametes for each and the first one. So you do your first outside, inside, last, same way, you, you know, imagine writing the Punnett square here and the formation of each of these gametes has a different probability. So if you look at these, two of these are known as the recombinants and two of them are known as the non-recombinants. So let's do the uh, non-recombinants green. So green here are the non-recombinants. So non-recombinants mean they did not recombine, they did not change. So they sorted together and they look like the parents. So in this case, the parents, the non-recombinants are one of these. They look like the gametes of the parents, hence non-recombinants. If you look at the likelihood, if there's independent assortment, there's a 25% of each of these, or 50% total. Whereas if we look at the ones that rearrange here, oops, pink, don't want to use that one. <laughs> let's go to this red right here. Um, let's go to red. These ones are called the recombinants. The recombinants mean they don't look like the parents. So neither of these combinations are found in the parental strains. And then for these ones, these ones also, if it's independent assortment and they're located on different chromosomes or really far apart on the same chromosome, these ones would also be 25% likelihood of each. So 25% of each, that's 100% total. Now, when we look at the difference over here for linked genes, let's draw out these gametes one more time. They'd be the same. So now these ones are linked together. So if we're looking at this, if we remember, you know, what a linked genes, it, what these are here, these ones are really close together. So there's a less chance to separate them, meaning more of the zygotes will look like the parents. So here for the recombinant, non-recombinants, each of these will be greater than 25%. Trust me, that's a greater than sign, not a seven. Um, so each of these are greater than 25%, whereas the recombinants will be harder to produce 
So the recombinants here are going to be less than 25%. And this is kind of the hallmark of all of this. And this is how it, we're, later in a future video, we're going to do a chi-square analysis, figuring out whether something is an independently assorting gene or a linked gene. And this is these percentages are part of the essence behind that test and determining whether two genes are linked, if they're close together, or if they're independent. Now, one thing when talking about linked genes are the notations for linked genes here. So notations for linkage. Let's say we have this cross here. You know, if you draw this out on a chromosome, it would look like this. So right here, so you know, we write it like this for simplicity, but remember this means this chromosome wise. So each of these, you know, one pair from each parent form homologous pairs, they can line up. Um, the non-sister chromatids can then exchange uh, chromosome piece sec sections of the chromosome during crossing over. Uh, so remember homologous pair joining and so forth. That goes back to all meiosis. But for this, we write it slightly different when we write linked genes. So instead of writing chromosomes out like this or this notation right here, we kind of identify the chromosomes using bars. So this would be one chromosome. This would be another chromosome. So think about these bar like this and twist it to the side. And then you write a the, the alleles on each side. And then, you know, you cross the other chromosomes like this. So this is what this cross actually can be represented as. Now you can take this one step further and just write, um, oh, well, we can show the result of the cross. So another option here for the result of this cross, you know, that you got the heterozygotes here, you can you know, write it like this. One bar can also represent two. So you can change the notation here. So this is important, that notation different. We don't write these double bars every time. Just understand that one bar means two chromosomes like this, or you can write this like this. Then you add a parenthesis, not parenthesis, a slash here that represents this as well. So imagine this now just turned facing this way almost. It uh, just makes it to keep it on one line to make it easier. And then you might ask, why do we write it like this? And you'll understand this a lot better once we get to three point test cross. It helps you see the cross. So the three point test cross, test cross is looking at three genes. So let's say if our, our chromosomes are you know, T, R, and E, or not our chromosomes, but our alleles are T, R, and E on one, and we're crossing it with the you know, heterozygous, this is one chromosome, um, and the other chromosome. Now, what if I say there was a you know, crossing over event that occurred at this end right here? You can visualize it a lot better. So if crossing over occurred right there, then the one chromosome would become ER in a recessive E, and the other one would be two recessives and a dominant E. So you can see that crossing over event occurred there, and you actually see where that exchange took place. So this is why you sometimes want to write them like this. And again, we won't see that fully, and it'll help you picture the three-point test crosses a lot better once we get to that section. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is, you know, just some terminology we might come across here in the next couple of videos and it's how they can line up uh, right here. So let's say we have our, you know, heterozygous dihybrid here. This can be right in, right in, written two different ways. So they could be in coupling or cis configuration. Remember cis is same. That's where both dominant traits or do, both dominant alleles are on the same chromosome. Both recessive alleles are on the other chromosome. So like we wrote uh, up here as well, even though this means this, remember that equals that. So dihybrid heterozygote, this is the same meaning right here. So remember this is same. Whereas uh, trans configuration is opposite or rotated. So this one means that, so here, or you now have a different one on each. It still means the same thing, but now think about it, how it means something different chromosome wise. This tells you one chromosome has a dominant and a recessive, and the other chromosome then has the recessive and the dominant. So they're different compared to this one where both the dominants are on the same one. So if you see what I mean there, so one is cis, and typically we just talk about how they're in coupling or cis conformation for most of the test crosses we're doing. It keeps things a little simpler. Um, so the, these arrangements can affect 
offspring ratios. So we just, you'll see problems saying, assume this is sip, uh, coupling or cis configuration and just makes you not have to think about that part anymore. So the last one to compare here is complete linkage, incomplete linkage. So for complete linkage, I think it's very, very close together. There's no crossing over that can occur. So between your two genes of interest, there's, their genes are linked so close together, you can't have a crossover event to, uh, to control, not control, to occur. And because of that, only non-recombinant gametes and progeny are going to occur. So that means 50% are going to be one parent and 50% are going to be the gametes of, other, of the other parent. So if we scroll back and look at this one, they'd each be, you know, either this or either that. You wouldn't have either one of these. If it was complete linkage, you wouldn't have any other one. So now compared to incomplete linkage, of course, you can have crossing over occurring. And this changes the ratios then of the offspring depending on how far they are apart. So some of these could have none, of course, still possible. Again, they'd all be non-recombinants. And you're going to start seeing me abbreviate non-recombinants as NR and recombinants as R. Whereas some do. And half of these would be non-recombinant and half would be recombinant, roughly. So then this frequency here of recombination increases with distance from the loci. So think about, you know, these two genes that are located pretty close together versus these two genes, which are on two different arms of the chromosome. You get a crossing over event to occur between there. That's a low chance. That's a low frequency of recombination or recombination frequency. That's what we're going to be talking about more in the next video and how we calculate it. Whereas over here, you have a much larger distance. So the further they are apart, the higher chance of a crossing over event occurring between them and the higher chance those alleles can sort independently. And that's the key moving forward here. And that's why I wanted to make this introduction video to gene linkage. So I hope this helps build us up for the rest of this chapter. Uh, next, we'll be looking at the recombination frequency and then a little bit of the chi-square analysis. And we'll get into two-point test crosses and then three-point test crosses. And then also a little bit on physical gene mapping to summarize this chapter. But that's all I have for today. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. And I hope you all have a great day and bye-bye.